Well, good evening. It's just about time for us to begin tonight. And uh, we're glad to see you. Look forward to our time together. have just a few announcements to mention once again. Nothing new really to add, but um, those uh, for the teenage and the college, the movie night tonight at our house. Hope you plan to be a part of that. Barbecue will be provided and bring sides, drinks, and desserts. And if you got about it, just show up. We'll have plenty. The Helping Hands are going to meet this Thursday at 10 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall for their monthly meeting and lunch. Uh, there's a menu. Um, the menu will be Fiesta Salad, and there is a sign-up sheet for what you'd like to bring out in the by the Secretary's office. If you have any questions, you can see Sue Wirtz about that. For the college and the young professionals, there's going to be a gathering Friday, June 1st, 6 to 8 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. And the theme will be soul food. If you can, sign up a list if you're interested in, in being a part of that. So we mentioned this morning about uh, getting close to, to Honduras. We still have a need for medications and uh, some clothing. So if you can check the list out in the foyer to see what their needs are and, and try to meet those before they go. We've also been talking about um, our VBS is coming up. We're going to have a, a VBS kickoff Devo uh, June 10th. That'll be Sunday night after services. And more information will come out as we get closer to that. But, but mark that on your calendars and also mark the VBS that will be the 11th through the 13th. Our opening song tonight will be 48. Our opening prayer by Jeremy Kinnamer. Our closing prayer by Hal Todd. Let's begin our worship as Rick Presidential reads from God's Word. This evening we'll be reading from Psalm 100. Psalm 100. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people, and the sheep of His pasture. Enter to His gates with thanksgiving, and into His courts with praise. Be thankful to Him, and bless His name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures to all generations. Our most graciously Heavenly Father, Lord, we are thankful for the church here at Maysville. We are thankful for the elders and deacons and the opportunities that they provide. We pray that all of us do our part into making their jobs easier. Lord, we pray for those who can't be with us tonight, whether they be traveling, medical, or just didn't want to be here, may you provide what they need to get back to their normal walks of life. Pray, Lord, for the men and women of our military, for the, for the freedoms that they fight and provide for us, just like one we are enjoying right now in the comfort of this building. Pray, Lord, for all the leaders of our, of our nation, from the president all the way down to just a local mayor of a town. May they provide peace in making our lives easier to live every day. Lord, we are thankful for your son who died on the cross. We thank Jesus for giving up what he gave up in heaven for a short time for the ultimate sacrifice. We are thankful for the Holy Spirit for, our, for writing our manual of the Bible we have today. Pray that all of us have the strength and knowledge to fight off the evilness of this world, that we can all live with you one day in, in eternity. Lord, forgive us when we fall short. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
number 48. Number 48, we'll do the first two stanzas, please. <clears throat> Three hundred twenty-one, three twenty-one. We'll do the first and the last of this one. <coughs> it may be in the Eight hundred eighty-nine. Little short song here. We've sung it before, but not maybe in a while. <clears throat> About the name of Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus. Like the 
678, 678. <clears throat> First and last. <clears> Through <throat> my mouth a lifeline across the dark way, there is a brother whom someone should save. Somebody's brother go who can will dare to throw out the lifeline's peril to share. Sixty six, three sixty six. A short little song here. It's kind of brief, but um, we'll do all three stanzas on the first line. On the second measure, I'm going to slow that down each time, just for emphasis, and and uh, then get back with a regular pace in the second line. <clears throat> going on in it on that one. Uh, this one here we'll use as our invitation 587. 587. And then we'll sing now number 781. 781. <clears throat> we'll do the first and the second stanzas. If you'd like to, please stand. We'll sing it together. <clears throat> Wonderful story of love. Oh, 
Be seated, please. Good evening. Hope everyone is doing well. Happy to see everybody out here uh, to our evening services. I haven't had any uh, visitors cards handed in to me, uh, but I know we have some visitors because I'm related to a couple of them who are here. I know my grandparents are visiting tonight, um, but whether or not you are related to me, if you are visiting with us, we are very happy to have you here with us and uh, hope you'll stick around for a little bit afterwards so that we can get to know you a little better and you can get to know us a little bit better. Um, Tonight's lesson, if you want to go ahead and be turning over to the book of 1 Thessalonians, I, uh, I kind of started a few weeks ago, and um, I, I had kind of my lesson outline, and uh, Angie said to me before uh, worship, she said, there's no way you're going to get anywhere near through that lesson tonight. And uh, I said, well, I'm, I'm trying to do something a little bit different, so I think I, think I will. And... Um, uh, so if you remember, I, I kind of closed it with the words, my wife was right, um, and uh, that's what I was talking about. So this is kind of a part two. Uh, it's a little bit, little bit different, but it's kind of a part two because I want us to look at a few verses here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Um, review just, just briefly uh, what we looked at before and then uh, go a little bit farther. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're going to start off in verse 16. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. So uh, what we said last time was that he starts this list off with three attitudes to have. He starts it off by saying, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So, um, rejoice always, verse 16. I think it's interesting because this is actually the shortest verse in the New Testament if you count the original letters. Um, but we, we talked about how uh, Paul was such a great example of rejoicing in all circumstances. We know that he was locked away in prison and at midnight he was, after having been beaten and bloodied and locked into an inner cell, he was singing and praising God and everybody was listening to Paul as he gave this example. He lived a life of being of rejoicing, of being joyful in all circumstances. Um, he was a guy who used to put Christians to death, and then his life changed substantially. He was able to see that he was able to have joy because of the influence that Christ had in his life. Without the things that were given to him by his faith in Jesus Christ, by his uh, conversion to being a Christian, there would be no reason to rejoice without that. Paul was a great example of rejoicing always. He also tells us to pray constantly, um, pray without ceasing, show that we depend on God. When we pray, that when we pray, we are showing that we have a dependence on the Lord and that we're not trying to do things on our own. And then he says uh, to give thanks in everything or give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Um, uh, we've talked a little bit about this uh, over the past few weeks in our Sunday morning Bible classes. We've been going through the book of Colossians and uh, Paul puts forth a, a similar verse right here. Uh, and, I, and I love to think about the way that little kids pray, right? And, and little kids they just, they just want to be so thankful for everything. All these little things. You never know exactly what it is, but the, they'll name their toys specifically that they're so thankful for. That You can, you can get so specific, and uh, I think as we get older, we kind of lose that, right? We get used to things. This is, this is the way that life is. This is the way, um, these are all the things that I have. It's, it's just, okay, now it's normal. I don't really think about it. But to them, everything's so new and so fresh um, that they, they will truly give thanks for everything if, if, you, uh, if you will just ask them to. Uh, that's the kind of life that we need to live. These are three attitudes we need to have. And 
I, I think about these, these three attitudes that um, we can all have. Each one of us, I think, can probably improve in each of these categories. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in everything. No matter where we are, we can all improve at least a tiny little bit. Paul kind of transitions here, and he starts talking about some extremes to avoid. Instead of attitudes to have, he starts talking about some things that you need to avoid. And um, uh, they're, they're somewhat different, but in some ways they are very similar in verses uh, 19 and 20. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies. Uh, now, in their context, it might have been a little bit different. Today's application uh, might be somewhat similar, um, but I, I think it's important to look at these two things. When we think about adding things into our life um, or trying to improve in certain areas of our life, I was listening to a guy talk this past week about uh, the, the psychology behind uh, behavior modification. Specifically, he was talking about getting in shape, right? And so I'm, I'm listening to this guy uh, talk about this, and he said, the reason why your New Year's resolutions fail is because you have a list of things that you want to do. And when you have a whole list of things that you are going to do, and if you fail in any one of them, it makes it a lot more likely for you to fail in all of them. The more things you add onto someone, the less likely it is that, that you're going to be successful in all those things. He said, if a person resolves that they are going to do one thing then it has over an 80% success rate. So uh, his example was if I say, I, I want you to be able to drink a liter of water a day, that that's over an 80% success rate that people will go, okay, I can do that. But he has a whole list of things. He says, when you start adding all these things together, you, you have two things you're trying to do at the same time, then all of a sudden it drops down to a 30% success rate. If you add three things, then it's about a 15% success rate. So um, maybe one thing that we can do is just look at this list right here and say, this week, I'm going to try to be better right here. I'm going to focus on this. And then next week, we'll worry about the next step. But this week, I'm just going to take this baby step. I'm just going to try to get better in this one way. Uh, wh whether we are, we have a strong prayer life, I think we could all communicate with the Father a little bit better. We, we might be very joyful, but I think we could also find ways in which we could be uh, more thankful. We might find ways in which we can have greater joy and share it with other people. That, that's just kind of some thoughts I had on, on that area. As we transition here and we look to verse 19, do not quench the Spirit. This is a very interesting passage right here because of the way in which Paul uses uh, the word spirit. Now, in, in uh, uh, the original Greek New Testament, there were no upper and lower cases. Uh, so everything was uh, uppercase, block letters, and it, there were no spaces in between words. So it, it's all there. So a lot of times it can be a little bit difficult to understand if you're talking about the Holy Spirit or spirit in a different sense as in uh, the human spirit, the Christian spirit. Um, and, and if we read both of these things, uh, it's interesting because this right here is the only time that uh, the spirit could in any, any way be somewhat ambiguous because um, in, uh, first, uh, in the text of 1 Thessalonians, um, it's used uh, Holy Spirit and your spirit are denoted. And so you actually know exactly what he's talking about right here. But when we see, do not quench the spirit, most of your Bibles are going to um, capitalize that and, and say spirit. Now, perhaps it was talking about um, the uh, motivation. Uh, don't, don't let your fire go out. Stay motivated. Perhaps that is what was, was being talked about. And it, and it would not be wrong or inappropriate, but it really seems from the context and from the next verse as well that exactly what he's talking about here is the Holy Spirit. Because he goes on to say, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Now, we obviously live in a different time today. We don't have miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. We don't have things that, um, uh, that are direct gifts of God, of, of healing or of prophecy, as we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but they did. There were tongues. Uh, people could speak in tongues. There were all kinds of things that people could do um, 
And there's a, a good chance that because of this, because of some of the things that were going on in the world, uh, people were worried about being drawn in by some of these things. They were worried about uh, being drawn in by whether or not it was actually a gift from God. Whether this might have been some kind of uh, conjurer's trick. We read about a, um, a woman who has a demon in her that uh, Paul casts out. Uh, that uh, caused uh, quite a commotion. We won't go down that um, rabbit hole, but Paul right here is basically encouraging the Christians, don't have an extreme reaction to something that you see. Now, um, overreactions are, are part of my everyday life. Uh, let me explain. If you ever want to see a good overreaction, just come over to my house, and I have a toddler, so eventually you'll see it. I don't know exactly when it will happen. I don't exactly know what will be said, um, you know, whether it is, uh, no, we're not going to have Oreos for breakfast, or uh, whether it is uh, Thursday night, I got this one. Um, uh, she said, Daddy, can we play hide and go seek? And I, of course, said, yes. And that was it, you know. <laughs> she she about lost it, and we and uh, just uh, just sobbed uncontrollably for a couple of minutes. Sometimes these little toddlers just can't rein in their emotions, and uh, you never know exactly what's about to to set them off. I think the church at Thessalonica was having some uh, extreme reactions with good intentions, trying to run away from false doctrine um, because they have seen things misused. They lived in a very different world than which we live in. So we read about these gifts of the Holy Spirit. They may have been concerned because they have seen people do things um, using power that was not of the Holy Spirit. And so, uh, so they, they were just trying to go away from this entirely. But the argument against some, excuse me, the misuse of something is not an argument against the thing itself right there. So it doesn't mean they needed to completely avoid it. Paul goes on to say, do not despise prophecies in verse, in verse 20. Now, we don't have the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. And let's turn over uh, and look to the book of 1 Corinthians right now. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we know this as the love chapter, but the way in which the chapter ends is interesting. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 8 says, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Paul is, is setting this up to the church at Corinth and saying, look, these miraculous gifts are only for a limited time. They have a specific purpose, and there is going to come a day when they all go away because their purpose will be fulfilled. He's using this to talk about love in a, in a similar manner that uh, love will always exist, um, even, even when we go to heaven. Let's turn over to a, a familiar passage, I, I believe, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we all know this, uh, this passage by heart, but it is a wonderful passage passage right here. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So Paul says these things are only going to be for a short time because when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Now, towards the end of his life, when he's writing to Timothy, the last letter that we know that Paul wrote, he's writing to Timothy and he says, the thing that is the perfect is the word of God. The thing that can make you whole, that can make you complete, that gives you everything that you need is God's word. So these things went away. But even if someone were to misuse scripture, we wouldn't want to... Uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? We wouldn't want to say, well, um, I, I, I can't believe the Bible because I, I heard this person say something that was false. You know, that's, a, that's an extreme example right there. Um, but that seems to be where the church in Thessalonica was going. 
They were so concerned with accepting something that was wrong on accident that they were accepting nothing except whatever Paul had just said to them instead of looking at it and comparing it to the Word of God. Now, that, that doesn't... Obviously, we need to confront false doctrine. Things that are, are false, things that are not of God, and things that do not match up when we compare them to the Word of God must be thrown out. But we don't need to... Uh, cover up our ears and refuse to listen. In um, Brother Hugo McCord's translation, I got a, a free copy of that. Um, he puts this verse, uh, uh, do not despise prophecies, as do not count inspired messages as nothing. Now, now the word here is prophecies, but I think that's an interesting way to put it and a very good application for us today. Do not count inspired messages as nothing. Don't think it insignificant that we have the inspired Word of God right here in front of us. We shouldn't take it for granted that we can open up our Bibles and study it at any time. That we can look to God's Word in any aspect of our life, any time, day or night, 24-7, 365. Don't think that's insignificant. Don't count that as nothing. Prophecy... Uh, specifically was actually the gift that Paul most desired for others to have. He says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 5, that he most earnestly desires for uh, the Corinthians to be able to prophesy, but maybe the church in Thessalonica had seen someone doing it falsely or somebody um, saying things that weren't true. Now, uh, obviously, since we don't have inspired prophets, there can still be instances where somebody says something wrong. Uh, maybe a good application of this would be, say, if someone said something that was incorrect in a Bible class, we would not say we should not have any Bible classes ever again, right? That, that might be an extreme reaction. That seems to be what they're doing right here. Um, instead, we should bring them back to what the Scripture is actually teaching. We don't accept a false teaching, we confront it head on, and we move on. Uh, we, ne we need to avoid the extremes. But that only comes when we become a little bit more familiar with the Word of God. We cannot combat false doctrine if we don't know what true doctrine is. Uh, I, I one time was, uh, was driving uh, over... Um, it, it, it doesn't matter where. I was 16. I've been driving for a couple of months. And I ended up fishtailing, and I was trying to avoid having a head-on collision. So I tried to get my car to go away from the other car. I managed to get it away from having a head-on collision, which is good. But I managed to get it into a ditch, which is not as good. So uh, the idea here is, why, why did that happen to me? Well, I was a new driver. I only had a little bit of experience. The Thessalonians here are new Christians. They did not have a lot of experience here. Paul's asking them to be more familiar with the Word of God in order that you can actually combat false doctrine. Call it out for what it is. And don't be afraid to call it out for what it is, but be able to correctly identify it. So wh whatever it is, that comes up, whether it's about the origin of the world, if it's somebody teaching something false on marriage, divorce, and remarriage, or drinking, or whatever the topic is, um, what we need to do is we need to take what they have taught and put it side by side the Word of God. That means we have to have the skill and we have to have the knowledge in God's Word to have the ability to do that, but we need to compare it with Scripture, not with what I would prefer not with what sounds familiar to me, but what does God say on the matter? Because in the end, that's the only thing that, that matters. He goes on, and uh, let's turn back and read this from 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verse 19, Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast to what is good. You cannot have those, uh, separate those first two verses from this one, right? Test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Turn over to um, 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, uh, John says in verse 1, 
He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, again, we, we don't have necessarily false prophets in the same sense in this word was used, but we do have many false teachers in this world. I think that's apparent. There are many people who are teaching things falsely. They don't teach the scripture accurately. But I, I find it very interesting that the Word of God here tells us to test these things. Right? It, it's not a concept of blind faith, as is sometimes uh, we are, as Christians, accused of having. Just blind faith. You don't care about the facts. No. God tells us we need to test everything. We need to ensure that it is true. And this is a unique aspect of the Bible and, and which um, a lot of non-believers uh, don't understand, I believe. From the very beginning, God's people were commanded to test the Word to ensure that it really was from God. Let's turn back to the Old Testament and look at Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18 Verse 18, he starts off and says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them what I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if in your heart you say, how may we know that the word of the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that word is a word the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. So uh, what, is, what, what is this passage being? Well, essentially, there, God is giving them a test to say, hey, how do you know if a prophet is truly from God? If what he says comes, is, is truth, if what he said comes true, comes to pass, then you know it is from me. But if it doesn't, you know it's not from me. Now today, uh, it's even easier for us. Because if somebody is preaching something and we cannot find it in the Word of God, we know that we are not to accept that. Uh, we are established that we have the Word of God, the, the completed Word of God directly in front of us. So if somebody says something is from God and we cannot find it in the Bible, then we know that that is not something we should accept. We're to test everything. Back to the New Testament, in the book of 2 Peter, let, let's turn over there, 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, Peter confirms this as well during New Testament times. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 says, Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It is our responsibility to test the things that will affect our souls. For example, um, it's very easy to put something on Facebook. Right? I can find a picture on Google and I can add words to it and make it say whatever I want. And I can put quotation marks around it. And I can add whatever name I want to add there. That does not actually make it true. In the religious world, there is a similar equivalent that happens quite often. But what happens? Those posts can get millions of views and people looking at these people, it will go viral and millions of people will look at it and instantly believe it. Is it true? No. But a lot of people look at it and automatically believe that it's true. Well, when it comes to things that affect our souls, I think there's a much higher standard of what we need to accept as truth. We need to be able to look at God's Word. I actually read a, a, a study, um, I, was, I was looking up something a few years ago that was talking about what the most well-known Bible verse is, and uh, you know, I thought it'd be John 3.16, and, and most of them say that, but I actually found one that said the most well-known Bible verse is, God helps those who help themselves. Well, uh, I'd like to ask 
any of you to find that in any of your Bibles, and, and we might need to have a discussion because uh, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> but somehow, the, this group of people that was polled said this was the most well-known Bible verse that they knew. Okay, that's, that's not in the Bible. But that's what happens. The church in Thessalonica was, was rejecting so much because they said, I don't want to go down the wrong road. And that's the right attitude. But they need to slow down and learn to discern between right and wrong. We take what we are given and we look at it and we compare it. And that goes true for anybody who is teaching a Bible class, anybody who is uh, preaching a sermon. It's supposed to be an interactive experience where we look at it and we say, does this match up with what's, what God's Word says? When, when we encounter something that's new, I've, I've heard somebody say, well, that's a really interesting perspective. I've never thought about it that way. And, and sometimes I've gone, there's a good reason for that. <laughs> Perhaps we shouldn't be thinking about it that way because that's incorrect. Um, I, I uh, was somewhat prepared for the kids to ask the question, why, right? Little kids, they ask the question, why, all the time. You know, why, why, why? Um, because they're learning about the world. They're trying to figure things out. Um, I say I was a little bit prepared. I was, um, I was prepared that it was going to happen. I was not necessarily prepared for how many times a day that that was actually going to occur, right? But one new question that I've been asked um, that's, uh, that's a really interesting maybe pause um, was, how do you know? Oh, okay. Um, how, how do I know? Um, that, that's not a bad question. <laughs> how do you know that that's true, Dad? Um, it causes me to stop and think about it for a moment. Okay, well, I, I have given you an answer. You've asked me a question. You've asked why. And then now you've asked the follow-up question. How do you know that's true? Well, for the Christian, how do we know it's in God's Word or it's not? Very simply put, how do I know? Because if the Bible teaches something, it teaches it somewhere. This week, one thing we can do is just decide that we're going to study our Bibles a little bit more. Just be able to have a little bit better understanding. or we'll pay a little bit better attention and compare what's being said with what is in God's Word. Put it side by side and make sure that what's being taught truly is found in the Word of God. Paul goes on in 1 Thessalonians and says, Hold fast to what is good and abstain from evil. So, once we have found out what is good and what is not, our response is pretty simple. We go towards that which is good, we run away from that which is evil. Turn over to uh, the book of Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 uh, Paul says the same thing, and he starts it off in Romans 12, 9, says, Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. The idea is that the Christians are going to be living in such a way to where they are running towards what is good and away from what is evil. Instead of trying to uh, find out where the line is, right? The line between... Um, between sinning and not sinning and walk that line as close as possible. That's not at all uh, the concept taught here in Scripture. Uh, trying to stay close to this line has, has at least two problems. Uh, first of all, that's not the attitude of Christ, was it? Christ did not come to the earth and try to live a life that was as close to sin as he could without actually sinning. He came to lie, he came to um, the earth and lived a life that was as far away from sin as he could possibly be. And then secondly, it's not really possible to walk that line. When you are so close, it makes it so easy to stumble and fall over it. Our goal is to run as far away from sin as is possible without making it just so easy to slip up and fall. We need to put away sin, and we need to pull close to God. Just w one more verse, and then we'll go back and we'll reread from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Turn over to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 29. 
Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he's saying right here, 529 says, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better for you that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than for the whole body to go to hell. We need to push away sin as much as possible. Not get as close to the line as we can without messing up. Push it away as far as we possibly can. This week, make a change that's going to push sin away. If, there, if there's an app on your phone that tempts you, get rid of it. If there's something, uh, a situation at work that causes you to stumble every time you see this person, try to avoid it. If not possible, pray about it before you go into it. Find a way to push the sin away. Not say, I want to do better and avoid sin, but push it away as far as possible. Push away these evil things and pull, toward, pull close towards God. Let's go back and, and close with reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, where we started. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. If we are successful in having those attitudes, pushing away the things of sin, pushing away evil in our life, then we have a promise of a place that's for us. We have a promise that God will keep, that he will bring us home to spend eternity with him. We can all resolve to just be a little bit better in these categories. To be able to do something, just one step, one baby step, just a little bit better. I know I can do to be a lot better as a Christian. Tonight, it hasn't been necessarily evangelistic, but maybe you've never started these steps. Maybe you know that this promise is not for you because you have never started down the path to following Christ. You have not believed in His Word, repented of your sins, confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, and been baptized to raise, rise up and walk a new life. Or maybe it is you've started down that path and realized that you're not doing the things that you should do not living your life as Christ would. You're trying to get too close to sin instead of pushing it away. If there's any way we can assist you, please come forward as we stand, as we sing.
you, Ryan. Appreciate that lesson tonight. 895 will be our closing song in, more, in a moment. 895. <clears throat> the Lord's Supper is still prepared tonight. If you'd like to partake of it and have that opportunity, make your way to the foyer at this time. You'll be shown where you can be served. I'd like to thank again our visitors. We say that every time, but we do mean it uh, for you being here. And if we can help you out some way or serve you, let us know and uh, look for you to come back any future time you can. I have our closing prayer after this song, 895. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid, I think I've lost my way. Still Blessed Father, we pray that you will walk with us this week, that you will guide our footsteps, that you will help us to be ever attentive to you in prayer, ever rejoicing, ever thankful. We ask this through our Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs>